Hey guys, well, we're going to try to wrap it up here in chapter 19. Once again, I'm probably not going to hit this in a lecture. Uh, it's a, uh, not much to this one, just kind of a set up chapter for our study of life on earth. Uh, and she does a pretty good, uh, pretty good PowerPoint here. So let's just run through it and then we'll wrap this thing up. We'll be, this will be all that we'll have on our, on our test, right? Going forward here. So here we go. Let's see if I can get this to work. You should be seeing this. Let's make sure you're seeing that. Uh, let me make sure you got that one. I think that is right. Sharing, let's do that again. Share the screen. Make sure it's right. Yeah, here we go. Okay. All right. Should be seeing that okay. All right. We're going to dive, run through this kind of quick. Uh, so, systematic biology, three domain system, and philosophy. Okay. Uh, here we go, real quick. So, then uh, taxonomy, then the branch of biology that identifies names and organizes the biodiversity and related categories. Okay, and once again, this this has been going on for a while, naming things and putting them in groups, but the big problem I got with this is, is that it, it, it's, it's ever evolving, it's changing. And when I learned the taxonomy uh, 30 years ago, I think none of it is called the same today. So that's very discouraging as a, as a, as a student, as a teacher, you want it to kind of stay the same and it does not. And they're still using DNA fingerprint stuff, they're still trying to figure it out. So it is kind of a, Confusing thing, and she does a good job. Meta does a good job. Here's kind of that laid out there. Uh, naming different began with the Greeks and Romans. Our style classified organisms groups such as horses, birds, and oats. Uh, the Middle Ages organisms were then described using Latin names. Okay, if you remember us talking about the different organisms, right? Archaea, regular bacteria, plants, fungi, animals, uh, invertebrates, and vertebrates. Uh, we, we attribute the beginning of systematic biology or the naming uh, with Carlos Linnaeus with development of the binomial. Uh, nomenclature, right, the genus species name, right, and we make a big deal about that, and then he went on to help break this down and go on into naming everything into the taxonomous groups of species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, kingdom, domain. Here is the rat and the uh, frog and their different groups, right, so classification is something we try to do. Uh, one of the hopes of the new one here, and it's still very difficult because it's hard to get some organisms or some similar into different species, um, I talked about your book talked about the, the, maybe someday having a scanner that can do a DNA barcoding and look for DNA like we do DNA fingerprints looking at short frag fragments of DNA and then it could maybe you could scan an organism and tell what it is they call it the barcode of life very much like the universal UPC codes on our food okay uh, but we're not quite there but it's possible that one day we could be able to scan something and your book uses example of some tuna that was sold uh, as tuna for eight fifty a pound but actually the DNA said it was tilapia. So that could have an interesting future. Okay, but we're not quite there yet on that. Uh, researches of uh, Carl, Carl Woos uh, was looking at RNA, uh, ribosome RNA sequences. He was able to determine that, remember that the bacterium and the archaeobacterium domain are not very close. And so he is the one that came up with the domain name to take it one bigger. So we have domain bacteria, domain archaeo, and then domain eukaryotes. Okay, within our kingdoms of protista, fungi, plant, animals in our domain. But remember the, the bacterium, prokaryotic, unicellular organism, reproduce sexually, some bacteria, photosynthetic, most heterotrophic, important ecosystem, blah, blah, blah. Dominant archaeo or prokaryotic unicellular organisms also live in extreme environments. Their cell wall is diverse but different from bacterium cell wall, more similar to ours. And then bacterial and archaeo different in ribosomal RNA, and ours is closer to the archaeo. Then our, then there's our eukaryotes with our four kingdoms on it that we talk about. And this is kind of his, this is the model of what he thinks happened. That common ancestor led to the bacterium and the archaeobacteria, and we branched off, the eukaryotes branched off of the archaeo with the mitochondria coming in first in the endosymbiotic, and then the chloroplasts later leading to the plants, protistas, fungi, animal, and protistas. Five, our one, two, three, four, five there, our kingdoms there, those. Protistas with the photosynthetic ones being on the side with the chloroplast there. So those four kingdoms. Here's some more showing some distinctions of these, right? Bacterium, archaeo, and eukaryote. Uh, unicellular, they're both eukaryote, we're multicellular, right? Uh, membrane, phospholipid, unbranched, varied branch lipids, phospholipid, unbranched. Uh, cell wall, uh, preptoglycan, yes, no, some yes, some no. Nuclear envelope, yes. All that another here, ribosome, some of our introns, us, uh, and some of the archaeobacteria don't. So anyway, just some co correlations there. 
So systematic biology is a quantitative science that compares traits of living and fossil organisms to infer relationship, relations over time. Uh, a phylogeny then is the evolutionary history of a group. Phylogeny is often represented as a phylogenetic tree, a diagram indicating lines of descent. Uh, and there's my phone going off. Let me take a quick pause here, real quick. Pause one second. Hey Rob, what's up, man? What you know? What's up? Okay. Well, I'll tell you what we can do. I, I, I'm gonna tell, if you don't mind, uh, uh, this is what I've been, I did on the first floor. Though they, we, don't, we have those printers in these labs we're not using. I would just grab, just, just take one out of uh, 307 and put it in there. No, I mean, they never never print anything in lecture, in lab. Because, you know, when we get the computers out, we do an online homework, but we don't, I mean, they never, I bet they had 100 sheets printed on them. So I've already, I had replaced one of them uh, before, you know, or at least I, I, have, I did the, the ink cartridge, but there's no reason not to take those out of one of those labs that they have never been used. Would that be okay? Save a little money. Just get it. You can pull the one out of, out of 307 and just swap it or our two or out of my EMP one lab. We never, we never print them. They're, I mean, they've never been used. Yeah, 307 or 207. Just grab that one and, and swap it out. Thank, no, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, I think I may have paused the screen sharing and not the video in here. Sorry about that. Are we still videoing? Okay, are we still recording? Let's see, I'm sorry. We're still, guys, I'm sorry. I, th I thought I paused the recording. All right, all right, sorry about that. So I guess you got a little information on me trying to save a little money with printers. But anyway, let's finish this up because we're about through with this chapter. Uh, not much to this in the mid all. Uh, so uh, look at this. So back to that. So then uh, the poly phylogeny is a, is there they're showing how they link together. And here's what one of these look like if I can get this thing to work. Uh, okay. And here's two terms that they, they use in this putting together the, these graphs showing that an ancestral trait is one present in all members of a group and present in the common ancestor. And it's not useful in determining evolutionary relationship because everybody has it. A derived trait is present in some members of the group, but absent in the common ancestor. And these are the ones that are used to classify according to this evolutionary relationship. For example, here we have all mammals have memory glands, as you can see right here. That's cool. Even toad hooves falls you over into this group, and you have the deer and then cattle, cattle and then shows the horns. Okay. Another trait was opposable thumb that we share with the monkeys and the apes in the shoulder in the shoulder rotation here. So these are all traits that are down the line from the common ancestor that can be used to make these trees. And from that, we can make uh, an assumption of these different, of the class, order, family of each of these and the, and the divisions of those organisms. Uh, cladistics is a method that uses shared derived traits to develop a hypothesis of evolutionary history in the cloud ground as a ground fossil is going that. So a cloud then is a cloud or cloud, whatever it is, an evolution branch that includes all of it. And here's one showing that. You can take these traits here, memory glands, hair, gizzards, epidermal scales, amniotic fluid, eggs, phalenos, vertebrates, and everybody had that notochord and the embryo. And from that, you can piece together an evolutionary tree here of the difference between the terrier, the finch, crocodile, lizards, frogs, tuna, and lancelet, and the chimpanzee. And this color ground, okay? Pretty cool. Uh, other ones, you know, fossil records here, another couple fossils can be looked at here. Homologs refer to structures that from the stem from a common ancestor. Analogs are structures that are not common, are from a common ancestor, but have the same purpose. And that, remember, so that would be like the wings of a, of a bird and the wings on an insect. They are not connected as a homolog, they're analog because they're examples of convergent evolution where two organisms develop wings for flight and they're no longer, they're not at all kin to each other. Okay, so analog structures have the same function in different groups, but do not have a common ancestor. Homologs have a common ancestor. I right, hear some uh, ancestral angiosperm. Okay, uh, other things can be looked at, behavioral traits, uh, molecular traits, a systematic, you know, looks at that. 
Systematics assumes it's you know that blah blah blah. Here's looking at DNA sequencing to compare and to put together this molecular data showing who's kin to who based on uh, the, the the molecular data collected. Once again, not a big chapter of mine, not a favorite thing of mine because it keeps changing, but it is a pretty good introduction. Sorry about the phone call in that, but y'all can live with that. Sorry about that. I thought I had to pause it. I paused the sharing. So y'all got to hear me talk on the phone about something. So anyway, not much here. Y'all have a good day. Very few, just to answer the questions, very few of this, very little of this will be on our final, I would suspect. All right, y'all have a good day. I'm going to stop this.